name's Michael Edmonds, and I would be Wisconsin Historical Society here today to talk about our new book, Risking Everything, a, a Freedom Summer Reader. Is it on? Come on up. That's okay, nobody's gonna look at this anyway, right, Jessica? <laughs> so Mark, I usually begin by asking people to imagine a world very different from today. Because if you're not over 50, I'm gonna guess you're 50 maybe? 58. 58, okay, maybe you can just remember this world. A world where instead of encouraging diversity, the government encouraged racism, where every aspect of life was governed by race, not just in the South, but all over the country. Where I grew up in Massachusetts, there were ads like this in the paper during my childhood. If you looked for a job, they were categorized by race. Of course, in many parts of the country, public accommodations were divided by race. And even in places like Wisconsin, there were what were called sundown towns, where it wasn't safe for black people to be in those towns at all after dark. The central image there is from a directory published here in Milwaukee, or in Milwaukee, um, of Negro businesses and businesses that were friendly to Negro customers. Because all over the country, black people could be denied reservations at hotels simply because of the color of their skin. Now, of course, Mississippi was the worst. The, uh, the South had been segregated for hundreds of years. And Mississippi was considered the most extreme example. Over 90% of black people in Mississippi could not vote. They could not register and vote. There were black majority counties where there were no black registered voters at all in the Mississippi Delta. Every aspect of life in Mississippi, the courts, the police, the media, preached white supremacy. And African Americans were denied participation in the same way that white residents were. Today, well, 40, in Mississippi at the time, about 42% of the population was black. Two-thirds of them had jobs left over from slavery days. They were domestic servants. They worked in fields like these two. And the wages of black people were about a quarter on average of white people. This is not at all uncommon. This would have been a perfectly common site, whether you were near a city or out in the Delta. The, the relationship, the... Uh, the property relations, the legal relations, were enforced by the police and backed by terrorist groups like the Klan. Now, how we got from there to the world we have today is a mystery to most people. Most people have what in the history business we call a heroes and holidays approach. Everybody's heard of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. It's funny, some kids have not heard of Malcolm X, but they all know the big names. And they think that change came about because celebrities, famous leaders, held big demonstrations and then the laws changed. Everything was okay. And I don't mean to denigrate those people. They really were leaders. But so too were thousands of other people, like these in the bottom photographs, whose names nobody knows anymore, who had to put their lives on the line in order to make America fulfill the promises of its founding fathers. And that's not really that long ago. You know, when you stop at a stoplight and there's an old black lady in the crosswalk, it's not unlikely that she grew up in the South and helped turn, these, turn this situation around. In southeastern Wisconsin, the majority of black families trace their roots to Mississippi or other western states. There aren't a whole lot of families here that came from North Carolina 
of Virginia. Hi guys, come on. Joshua. Yeah. Um, so it's not long ago and far away. It's right around us today. These people are still alive. I was in Mississippi in June six weeks ago. And the people who are in some of these photographs and the ones in the exhibit were there to talk about what it was like for them. What I want to do today is to talk maybe for 20 minutes, half an hour, about what happened that summer, the summer of 1964 in Mississippi. And then talk briefly about what your state historical society is doing to commemorate that. And then um, talk a little bit about why Wisconsin's involved in commemorating this at all. I mean, didn't this all happen in the South? Because it's an interesting story. It's not told on the, the exhibit panels here. And you know, there's like, wait, one, two, three, four, five, if we count Jessica. Interrupt, okay, wave and say, wait a minute, I got a question, okay? I'm not gonna stand up here and lecture. So let's start with 1964. 50 years ago, there were four major civil rights organizations in the country. There were others that were smaller, but these were the big ones. Um, the oldest was the NAACP. It was founded in 1909. It was an integrated organization. And, and for decades, it had taken the point of view that if you change the laws, society would change. And it was the NAACP that was largely responsible for the landmark desegregation cases, like Brown versus Board of Education, the big ones. They're the ones who took that, took those places to court and got the law changed. They wanted to move slowly and they thought that eventually justice would come. The next oldest was CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. It had been founded in the 1940s uh, based on the nonviolent principles of Gandhi in India. In fact, some of its founders had been to India and studied with, with Gandhi's students. And they thought that the law, changing the laws might not be enough. You'd have to take direct action in order to get the laws enforced. And they, they, they held a freedom ride in the late 40s, 49 or 50. They held an integrated bus ride across the South. Nobody paid any attention. But they were, had been in the field for decades, too. In the mid-50s, with the Montgomery bus boycott, Mont, uh, Martin Luther King started the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And that was dominated by black ministers and, again, committed to nonviolence. Certainly more activists than the NAACP, but again, preached patience. Things will change. And the fourth was SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He, it was composed mainly of college students who dropped out of college in order to work for um, desegregation. Most of them were the first people in their family to go to college. They were giving up a lot. It was about 90% black, but they did have white members right from the start. And SNCC has been called the shock troops of the civil rights movement. They were not so much interested in what happened in courtrooms. They were interested in sitting down at the lunch counter and demanding service, or putting their bodies in front of the police dogs and demanding justice. In, in 62, in Mississippi, the four of them banded together to form that organization, COFO, which was just a Mississippi organization, to try to work for civil rights in Mississippi. And it's COFO that ran Freedom Summer. Freedom Summer was made up of about 120 paid staff from SNCC and from CORE. SNCC, uh, these are SNCC leaders here. SNCC put up about 80% of the money and 80% of the people in CORE, about 20%. This is Bob Moses, the same guy as here. He was the, the director of the Freedom Summer Project, the Mississippi Summer Project. He had grown up in Harlem, got a scholarship to Harvard, had a master's degree in philosophy, then the sit-in started in 1961, 60, 61, and he felt he had to be involved. And he lived in Mississippi for most of 61, 2, 3, was shot at, almost killed. Um, the, I thought his assistant or the deputy director was Dave Dennis, who had been in charge of CORE's efforts in Mississippi and Louisiana for uh, the same early 60 years, 60s years. They got paid $10 a week when there was money. How were they funded? Um, Donations from the north, for the most part. So while these folks were down south working in the streets, other members of the organizations were touring the north, holding rallies and trying to raise money. To get Freedom Summer off the ground, the, the expenses for May, June, and July were about $50,000. So it wasn't a whole lot of money. I mean, it's more money than it is today, but it wasn't insurmountable. 
they're always in the documents that we put online they're always begging for money and saying we, we ran out of paper we don't have a typewriter we can't buy gas so those are the people who were paid and who really ran ran the whole thing they were joined by hundreds of volunteers there were between 900 and a thousand college students from the north nearly all of them white and uh, there were also attorneys clergy, doctors, and nurses who came down for the summer, or part of the summer. In most places, the uh, Freedom Summer Project office looked like this. The project leaders in the office were always SNCC or core people. They were generally people who had grown up in the South, black, and experienced. And then they were helped out by all of these naive white folks from the North. Here's a typical situation of a Freedom School teacher teaching her students. But there were also tens of thousands of people who lived in Mississippi who were involved. At least 60,000 people participated, and we know that because they took part in an election and we know how many votes there were. Hundreds of them housed the volunteers in their homes, risking their lives. If you said, yes, I'll take three Freedom School teachers, they can live in my house for the summer, chances were very good your house would be bombed or at least shot into. So these people, just common people, were risking their lives to be involved. There were Freedom Summer offices all over the state, from Holly Springs up here in the north, down to Moss Point and Biloxi and Gulfport in the south. The state capital is at Jackson here, which is where the office was run. In June, I swung by the building that was the office, and it's like a little storefront like you see over on Washington Avenue that's got a bakery in it or something. It's a very small thing. A lot of projects were concentrated here, which is the Mississippi Delta region, because that's where the racism was the worst and where the disenfranchisement was the worst. So what were they trying to do? They were trying, to, first of all, to register voters, because less than 10% of African Americans could vote. And the idea was, if we could get more people to vote, then they would elect sheriffs and school, school boards and mayors who, instead of oppressing them, would serve them. This had never happened, for reasons we'll go into. So the first idea was register people to vote. And what's happening here is here's uh, two, three volunteers trying to persuade this old woman sitting on her porch that she should go down to the courthouse, like the woman in the picture below her, and register like the guy on the right. But that was really dangerous, and most people wouldn't dare do it. And most of those, 90% of those who did try, were not allowed to register. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But that was the, the first goal. Second goal was to set up freedom schools. In Mississippi, the schools were segregated, completely segregated. And in black neighborhoods and in rural black areas, um, most residents did not go beyond the sixth grade. As somebody told me in Mississippi that until he went to a freedom school in 1964, he'd never heard the word algebra. He was a teenager. He didn't know algebra existed. So the idea was we'll start schools and we'll remedy that ignorance, but we'll also teach people about politics. We'll teach them black history. We'll empower them in a way that they're not empowered now. The guy who had the idea for the freedom schools, named Charlie Cobb, said, I think it's on one of the banners down here, um, they wanted to teach people to question because to question was to challenge, and to challenge was to overthrow. So they were trying to undo decades of white supremacist conditioning. They wanted to set up community centers in all of those towns, because in black neighborhoods, if there were any libraries at all, they were not like this one. They were hand-me-down books, open very few hours. There were no healthcare services. There were no sidewalks and streetlights in black neighborhoods. So the idea was, we'll set up a community center where black residents can go to get the same basic social services that white people get. And um, in some places they had to build them from scratch and in other places they rented them. These became the centers for Freedom Summer in many towns. Now in Mississippi there was only one party. There was no Republican party. The Republicans were the bad guys. They had come down after the Civil War. It was the party of the Northern aggressors. There was never any Republican party to speak of in Mississippi. The Democratic Party was completely controlled by white racists. Okay, black people did not get to participate in it at all. This is like from 1900 to 1960. 
So in order for black people, to, black residents to take part in politics, the folks who started Freedom Summer said, we need a new party. We have to start a whole new party. And they called it the Freedom Democratic Party. And there were offices locally all around the state where people learned how to hold meetings, um, elect candidates, come up with platforms. And the idea was that that experience would be good because eventually they were going to take part in politics. And that because their party was open and represented people more democratically, the party would go to the Democratic National Convention in August and say, the mainstream party doesn't represent the state. We represent the state. And they challenged the right of the mainstream party to participate in, in the national election. I think that's the next slide, actually, is it? No, OK. So Freedom Summer began in the middle of June. There were two one-week-long training sessions held in Miami, Ohio, uh, Oxford, Ohio. Um, where the volunteers got together and the people in SNCC and CORE and other places trained them about what to expect. And I'll um, read from a letter in the book about uh, what that was like. This is a guy from New York writing home to his parents from Ohio and he says, the dorms are very nice, beds with sheets, and the food is excellent. We get up at 7.30 and throughout the day go to general orientation meetings and special sections depending upon what post you'll go to. The staff, those with whom we'll be working throughout the summer, are amazingly competent. Almost all are Negroes from Mississippi who have been jailed and beaten many times, but still have a reverence for the movement. All are sort of quiet, with wry senses of humor and a feeling you get of strength and ability to get you out of a tough situation. So they trained for one week, and then June 21st, all those folks headed for Mississippi. June 22nd, another wave of volunteers came in. They trained and came on the 29th. And on the very first day, oh, sorry, they were not the only ones who were getting ready for Freedom Summer, because of course, the white officials in Mississippi were getting ready. The legislature passed laws that made it illegal to leaflet or to demonstrate or to boycott. You, got, you go to jail if you do those things. The state police doubled in size. The mayor of Jackson says here, we've got a larger than usual police force. It's twice as big as any city our size. It was, the force was built up to control voter registration and civil rights workers. We're going to be ready for them, he says. They won't have a chance. The picture on the right is police marching toward voter uh, registration. Uh, people lined up to, to register to vote in the city of Hattiesburg. So the police were getting ready. Local businesses got ready too. They formed um, in the late 50s and early 60s, but especially in the spring of 64, citizens councils. This is sort of like the Chamber of Commerce, the white supremacist Chamber of Commerce. Their, their motto was states' rights, racial integrity. And what this meant was that if black residents joined up with the civil rights workers, the bank would foreclose on their mortgage. Their boss would fire them. And they could take economic measures against people who were activists. So they organized that spring to make sure that local residents would be shut down. And of course, it was all backed by the Klan and racist vigilante groups. Um, it's hard today to really imagine to appreciate the violence that these people faced. Here's a, the, um, an excerpt from a diary of a white volunteer from California. He was uh, in the second wave. He's arriving, um, geez, I think it's August 2nd he arrives. That's 50 years ago today. So he makes this note in his diary. Arrived Jackson, Mississippi, COFO office, approximately 10.30 p.m. Saturday. Five minutes later, a volunteer was assaulted with a baseball bat directly across the street. Twelve stitches were taken in his head. The office is in the heart of the Negro ghetto. The assailants were white. Ten minutes later, Silas McGee, a field secretary for SNCC, was shot in the head in Greenwood. Five minutes later, a Negro was shot in the leg here on Lynch Street, only one block from this office. Simultaneously, a cross was burned at Terry and Lynch, four blocks away. During the course of the summer, there were 60 bombings, dozens and dozens of beatings like that. Six people were killed. At least six people were killed. And anyone who participated, any community who participated, 
risk this happening to them. This church in Macomb, in, just down toward New Orleans, um, agreed to host a freedom school. And they hosted a freedom school that summer, and when it was over, their church was destroyed. So on the first day, June 21st, three of the Freedom Summer workers disappeared. This is at the end of that first week of training. They went down to Mississippi to investigate the burning of a church that had agreed to host a Freedom School. And they went there, they talked to the pastor, they talked to the congregation who would talk to them, and then they headed back to their office in Meridian. They were pulled over for speeding, arrested, and never heard from again. They were James Cheney, who grew up in Meridian, Mississippi, a uh, core worker, a volunteer from New York named Mickey Schwerner, and one of the newcomers who had first gone south um, and had just been trained in Oxford, Ohio. And a couple days later, the car they were in was found deep in a swamp nearby, all burned out, but nobody knew what happened to them. This got the nation's attention. As long as black people were being lynched and murdered in the South, nobody cared. It didn't even get reported in the local news. But Freedom Summer leaders knew that if they brought the sons and daughters of professors and business owners and senators to the South, and they were getting beat up and arrested, the nation would wake up. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. The last week of June, the whole country started to pay attention, television, newspapers. And there was this mystery for the whole summer. Where are these three civil rights workers? What happened to them? Well, the experienced people knew what happened to them. They were already dead, but there was no evidence. The officials in Mississippi said that it was all a hoax. And everybody went to work anyway. They went to work trying to register voters, like I said before. Here's canvassing door to door and then lines of people waiting to get in. The, the registrar inside the courthouse would sometimes only let one person in at a time, make them take a whole hour. So if 100 people lined up outside, four or five might get to try to register. This is what registration consisted of. The notice on the wall behind those guys tells them that, in fact, their names will be published in the newspaper for two weeks because they tried to register to vote. And that was true, it was a state law, it was across the state. Everybody who attempted to register to vote, their names were published in the newspaper. And so that gave the Citizens Council a, a list of everybody to go after. When I was doing this talk in Mississippi, a woman came up afterwards and said, that's my grandfather. Mm -hmm. So now we know who that guy is. Mm -hmm. She couldn't remember if he passed the registration test that day or not. And the test was, the test was arbitrary. Here's a voter registration worker from Wisconsin, in fact, a volunteer from Wisconsin, writing home. In Mississippi, one must fill out a form with 18 questions on it to get on the voting roll. The 18th question is the kicker. It asks the applicant to read any section of the state constitution that the registrar chooses and then interpret it in simple language to the satisfaction of the registrar. Of course, no Negro can satisfy him because the registrar can just say no. That's it, there's no appeal. We were also told that the registrar would sometimes ask questions like, how many bubbles in a bar of soap? Also, any applicant has his name published in the paper, which allows his employer, employer to fire him and tells the local toughs where to lob their bombs. Historians think about 17,000 people took the test that summer, and about 1,600, a tenth of them, actually registered and were allowed to vote. The other thing, you saw the people in the last photo lined up. Whenever there was a freedom day where people would try to go to the courthouse and vote, lots of supporters would come. They did not resist the police when they were arrested. Um, so there were nonviolent demonstrations all summer long in those towns on the map you saw. They set up freedom schools, which I talked about before. At the end of the summer, the person who coordinated the freedom schools wrote in her final report, through the study of Negro history, students began to have a sense of themselves as a people who could produce heroes, which was really the underlying agenda for the freedom schools. The students were taken seriously in freedom schools. They were encouraged to talk, and their talking was listened to. They were assigned to write, and their writing was read with attention to idea and style, as well as grammar. They were encouraged to sing, to dance, to draw, to play, to laugh. They were encouraged to think, and all of this was painful as well as releasing, because to be taken seriously requires that one take himself seriously, believe in himself, 
and that requires confrontation. So freedom school was painful for the kids who grew the most. At the conference I went to in Mississippi, there was a panel that was just people who had been students. Um, and of course, all of them said it totally changed their lives. They had never, ever been taught to think about things like this or encouraged to think or listened to and taken seriously. About 2,000, between two and 3,000 kids enrolled in freedom schools. There were about 200 teachers. They lasted all summer. On August 4th, which is Monday, the bodies were found. They had been arrested, held until about 10 o'clock at night in a small town jail, and released by prior arrangement to the Klan. In fact, the police officers in that county were Klan members. This guy who's laughing at his arraignment is the deputy sheriff of the county. He was one of the people who abducted them. Behind him are some of the other people who killed the three of them. They, uh, if you saw, did you ever see the movie Mississippi Burning, 1988 movie? Okay, um, it's fiction. That's, you know, that's not how the events happened, but that environment is very much what it was like. So the nation was shocked. They continued working in Mississippi anyway. They got together the Freedom Democratic Party. They chose delegates to go to Atlantic City. It was 1964, and Lyndon Johnson was president. He was going to get renominated to be president again. And there was no drama in the convention. It wasn't going to be very newsworthy. Except that there were all these people from Mississippi coming saying they were the ones who ought to be participating, and not the white racists who had always controlled the state's party. So they, they arrived in Atlantic City on August 22nd and gave testimony before the convention's credentials committee. And this woman down at the bottom left here is Fannie Lou Hamer from Mississippi, one of the, the great civil rights leaders of the 60s who's not well known. She, on national television, explained how she had been arrested and tortured for trying to register to vote. And at the end of her testimony said, is this America? Is this the land of the free and the home of the free? Tears just running down everybody's cheeks in the room and across America. So Lyndon Johnson in the White House called the television networks and said he had a press conference and they all switched over to cover him and he talked about his dog or something. He, he just did not want these delegates from Mississippi to upset the convention. He was afraid that if they did, he'd lose the South in November and then he wouldn't be able to get any of his agenda through without the support of Southern senators and congressmen. Uh, what happened was the Democrats in Atlantic City said no. Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, you don't get to play. But in, in the process, they had been liberal enough that the white delegation said, we don't want to be part of this either, and they left. So no one from Mississippi represented the state at the Democratic National uh, Convention. The Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party decided to hold its own election, parallel to the official one. Since black people couldn't vote, they said, let's just do our own and they nominated candidates, and they ran a campaign, and they held separate votes, and wherever, and this is right the day before, November 3rd was the official election, um, wherever the two elections happened back to back, wherever there were Freedom Democratic Party candidates running against the mainstream ones, the Freedom Democrats get got more votes. And this told the National Democrats, wait a minute, black voters are really important. We can't ignore them anymore. Well, during the official election, the white supremacists won anyway, because only white people could vote and they were the only candidates. But when they went to Washington, the leaders of Freedom Summer and the FDP went to Washington too, and they said, these guys don't have the right to occupy those seats because the election wasn't fair. Black people didn't get to vote. And the House of Representatives debated it for nine months. And in September, they said the same thing the Democrats had said. They said, no, the white supremacists keep their seats. Next time we'll be better. Next time we'll do it differently. So what happened during the fall of 64 was that a lot of civil rights leaders, especially those in SNCC and CORE and the volunteers who had been putting their lives on the line in the summer, were just disgusted. They thought white liberals had betrayed them. There was no point looking for help anywhere else. They needed to take matters into their own hands. They thought that they had failed. They thought that Freedom Summer had been a total failure. Very few people had registered to vote. It's true there were some freedom schools, but six of their friends were dead, hundreds had been arrested and beaten, and they were very, very discouraged. 
um, the ones that I talked to in Mississippi confirmed that there was this sense of total failure. But what they had done, they couldn't see it at the time, was they had raised the consciousness of the whole country. All around the country, Americans were just outraged at what they saw on their televisions. And they contacted their legislators and said there has to be civil rights legislation. So that was the first outcome that's important. The second was they, they trained all those tens of thousands of people in Mississippi how to be involved in politics. And so when the voting rights law passed in 1965, just nine months after Freedom Star, they were ready and they knew what to do. Now the Voting Rights Act passed in the summer of 1965. And it said two things. First of all, it said, you, you can't give people tests to, to vote. Anybody who's a resident and a citizen gets to vote. And if you don't let them vote, we're going to send the US government into your courthouse to register them and make sure they vote. And that would not have passed if what you see on these banners in Freedom Summer had not occurred. It took 10 years for the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act actually to take effect because local governments opposed it all over the country, including here in Wisconsin. It uh, was not, the Civil Rights Act was not enforced in Milwaukee until 1977. So that's the end of the history part. Any questions at this point? This point. Early on you mentioned CORE. Yeah. And you said something about a bus thing in what years? I think it was 49. Um, they organized right after interstate transportation was desegregated by federal law, because the federal government regulates interstate commerce. So the federal government in Washington said, can't, can't have segregation on you know, interstate buses. They organized a ride in it, I think it was Washington to New Orleans, and there was no opposition and there was no violence, there was nothing, it didn't, it's hardly even covered in the news. Huh. And I don't know why that was so different than 15 years later. Anything else? <coughs> okay. So it's the 50th anniversary of these events. And um, at the Wisconsin Historical Society, we decided to commemorate the anniversary a couple of different ways. First, we digitized a lot of original documents from these days, letters, diaries, and so forth, and made them available free on the web. And um, take one of these if you want to look at it. They're over there on top of that bookshelf. This is a postcard that describes the online. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. You can make sure everybody's got one of those. The, the web address for the digital archive is wisconsinhistory.org Freedom Summer. So what we did was we put on the scanner. You've put stuff on the scanner, right? We put on the scanner people's letters, people's diaries, over a thousand photographs, minutes of meetings, phone logs. There was um, a central phone line at the office in Jackson. So anywhere in the state where there was an emergency, they'd call into Jackson for support. And all of those phone calls coming in were typed up in logs. We have those in Madison. Flyers, handouts, posters we put online. Now, that's great. To have 30,000 pages of original documents is great if you're writing a PhD dissertation or a book. But for most people, it's overkill. It's not useful. So the next thing we did was set up a Facebook page, 1964 Freedom Summer Collection. And every day, we highlight one of the documents in the archive. So if you use Facebook, on the um, exhibit brochure, this one, it's also over there. Oh, nope, sorry, it's not on here. Well, just remember, go to Facebook and do, look for Freedom Summer in Wisconsin, and you'll find us. Come and like us. And basically, I, I put out a little description of a document, a picture of it that links back into the digital archive. And, and we have over 500 followers at the moment. Sometimes thousands of people start talking about things. Uh, and it's a way to participate in history without having to look at thousands of pages of documents. We made this exhibit that's right here with the help of a donor in Milwaukee. Um, and it's been traveling through libraries and museums here in southeastern Wisconsin, as well as schools. Uh, several thousand people have come to look at it already. 
it's going from here up to the Black History Museum in Milwaukee, and then in September starts going through Milwaukee area schools again. It was the donor who said Milwaukee area schools, the donor who gave us the money to do it. But if you know anybody in Racine that would like to have it in their school, I think we could probably figure out a way to do that. The exhibit has a companion website, which is on the, the brochure that Jess just gave you. And that has lesson plans and other things for making it easy to teach from the exhibit. And we published this book that I have been reading from. I brought a few copies if you'd like to have one. It's $20. And it contains about uh, 45 documents, like the ones I've been reading from and the ones quoted on the panels here. One of the architects of Freedom Summer who read the proof said, if you couldn't be part of the glory and sorrows of the Freedom Mississippi Freedom Summer, the closest alternative is this book. And she's, that's great praise. When I went down to Mississippi for the 50th reunion with all the people who had been there, um, all of them praised the exhibit. The exhibit was down there and, and the book as well. So I think we got it right. I think you can trust it. So the last part of today's talk, how am I doing on time, Mark? few more minutes for me. But. All right, okay, no, no, well, we can go for it fast enough so you get the big picture. Why is this stuff in Wisconsin? Well, it's in Wisconsin because some of the people who were involved came up to Madison as students in ni the fall of 1964 or 65 or 66. Um, Alicia Kepler was an undergraduate and she belonged to SNCC. Uh, Vicki and Bob Gabriner had been active in Tennessee and a different thing. Mimi Feingold was a core volunteer. She had been arrested on one of the first Freedom Rides. She looks about 12, right? I mean, she was in college then. She was 19. But today, she still looks really young. Um, in 1966, um, Russell Gilmore was on the receiving end of the stuff they collected here. These two women joined in 1966. Gwen Gillen had been a SNCC staff member in the South and with Stokely Carmichael had gone off to look for the three murdered men when they disappeared. In the summer of 64, Bob and Vicki were working, doing voter registration work here. Mimi was down in Louisiana, and Gwen was working in the Delta um, trying to register voters. And she told me that she would work all day in the cotton fields with them and then say, come to a voter registration training class tonight, and they would come. Oh, sorry. So they went, when they got to Madison in the fall of 64, um, Bob and Vicki Gabriner and Mimi Feingold, no relation to Russ, went to the, the head of the society and said, we gotta collect this stuff. Um, everything's happening on the ground and these, the evidence of what's happening will disappear. Okay, all that will survive will be the NAACP's file cabinets in their New York office. So we gotta get this stuff on the ground and we can do it because we were just down there. And the head of the society said, no problem, we'll put you on the payroll, go for it. He connected them with uh, a staff member in Madison who would actually get the stuff as they collected it. First, they collected from everybody they knew, writing letters, asking things to be shipped. They got everything they could. They got dozens of collections of letters and diaries and stuff that way. Then a year later, in the summer of 66, they went back to the South. Bob and Vicki worked up here where they had um, originally done their voter registration work. Mimi Feingold worked in Louisiana where she had volunteered for court. On the previous slide, what did that fellow say? Don't blink an eye. Official didn't blink an eye. He said, this is great. I mean, he said, we'll pay you for it. They expected, you know, that this research institution was not going to take them seriously, but it did. So, um, Bob and Vicki collected in Tennessee, couldn't collect much in the north in Mississippi, but went over to Arkansas where they met with Daisy Bates, who had led the Little Rock School desegregation fight. You probably read about that um, in textbooks. And Daisy Bates said, yes, this is great. You can have all our stuff. And what her stuff was included this rock thrown through her window with a note wrapped around it that said, next time will be dynamite, KKK. And um, because she was well known and a great leader, her blessing for the collecting project opened all doors in Arkansas, and we collected lots of stuff from Arkansas. Not so much in Mississippi. People were pretty skeptical in Mississippi. Bob and Vicki went through the Delta, and people wouldn't give them anything because they were white, they were northern, they were just not trustworthy. 
Mimi, meanwhile, went down to Louisiana to try to collect records down there. Maybe I can do it from here. Yeah. Driving around in black rural Louisiana, she says today, was like going back in time a century or so. The roads were dirt or gravel, wind would blow dust in your face. Most of my donors were ordinary local blacks who had fought for civil rights in small towns like Clinton or Plaquem in Louisiana. They had no idea that anything they might still have hanging around their modest homes, shacks really, would be considered valuable records. Their concern was not so much any reluctance in parting with the stuff, but with why in the world I or anyone else would want it. In the uh, 66, 67 school year, some of the people who had started the project, like Feingold herself, went on to other things. They got their degrees, and they finished. And so um, they hired Leah Wise, Leah Johnson, and Gwen Gillen to do collecting the next year. This is the office where all the collecting was done. Gee, I did it again, sorry. Gwen had been 17 years old when she joined SNCC. She was its youngest staff member and they were delighted to have her because she couldn't be charged with corrupting minors if she tried to organize high school students because she was a minor. And here she is singing freedom songs with other SNCC staff. You can see how young these people were who were putting themselves in front of the police dogs. That's when a couple of years later. And in 1967, Bob and Vicki Gabriner and Leah and Gwen went back. And because Gwen knew everybody in SNCC in Mississippi, they were, she and Leah were able to collect a lot in Mississippi. Um, they traveled in separate cars. You couldn't, it was very risky for uh, white people and black people to travel in the same car. So Leah and Gwen went in one car, Bob and Vicki went in another. Leah and Gwen, called on Fannie Lou Hamer, who I talked about earlier. She had survived beatings by police, dodged gunfire from the Klan, helped launch the Freedom Summer Project. She knew every movement leader in the South. Johnson and Gillen assumed she'd have a large cache of important papers. When they pulled up in front of her two-room home, though, she was outside in the yard burning all her own papers. She said there were so many she didn't know what to do with them all, Johnson recalls, and had no idea they might interest anybody else. They came back the next day and she had found a few that she hadn't burned. What did they collect? Political flyers, notes of meetings, press releases, newspaper clippings, handwritten documents, the snapshots people took, pamphlets that the organizations produced, uh, memos written for internal distribution only. So this is how history is written. I mean, you can go back in the other room there to the nonfiction section and read some 250-page book about Freedom Summer, and the person who wrote it looked at tons of stuff like this, and that's how they know what happened. So we collected tons of stuff like this and made it available this year on the web. During 64, 65, 66, when that project was collecting, you can see they collected a huge amount, over 200 collections. And then for the next decades, more rolled in steadily from those same contacts. Till today, there are over 300 civil rights collections down at Mad Madison, the building I work in. You can see the stats there, almost 10,000 photos. That's what's inside in archives. You don't usually get to see behind the scenes, but it's just miles and miles of boxes. In April of this year, we brought them back to Wisconsin. They gave a, pre a program in Madison and a program in Milwaukee, and they met with lots of classes from middle school to university kids. That's what they look like today. And uh, to end with, I want to read you something Vicki said, if I can find it, assuming I can. For us, it was the opportunity of a lifetime, both the work we did organizing and then being able to go back to other parts of the South and do this collecting. The work was just so compelling and the possibilities were so exciting. But for us to be given the opportunity and have our breakfast paid for, I can always remember pulling in and having grits for breakfast when we were traveling, was a great gift, a great gift. And it wasn't just a gift to them, it was a gift to us. 
because without that collecting, we wouldn't know what happened on the ground during Freedom Summer. There you go. That's everything I have. Questions? Yeah, Mark, run away. You have to run away. You told me. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure, my pleasure. So, um, if you're interested in why your state has this great collection, take one of these. Pass one back there. Did I give you one last time, Jessica? I don't think okay, so. let me give you one. They're almost all gone, so get one while you can. <laughs> this is an article that I wrote that came out in June. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And the next time you see some eccentric old black lady crossing the street in front of your car, this was the world she lived in when she was your age. You guys are what, 19? 20. 20, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's because she did what she did that you have the world you have now. Okay, thanks.